Yeah, amen, amen. It's good to see everybody. We're, we're excited today what the Lord's going to do. Of course, you know, it's so cool because, you know, throughout the week, you're conversing with the Lord, talking with Him and stuff. Josh, how you doing, Josh? All right. So, uh, you know, here's, here's the thing, though. You know, it says that we come and we gather together on Sunday. We bring a song. We bring a spiritual word. You know, our time gathering together is all the culmination of the week of the Lord speaking to our hearts to come and to, to lift him up and give him glory, give him praise, and to minister to him. And so that's exactly what we're going to do today. You with me today? Amen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Father, so in your precious name, God. I thank you that we're able to come today and lift up your name, God. Father, we pray, God, the great things that you're going to do today in hearts and lives of people. God, that you would just reveal yourself, Father, in a supernatural way to every person here today, God. And we love you. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Things in your name that 
Shout of praise this morning. Lord, we thank you. God, you are a mighty God. Nothing is impossible to you, God.
mountain be made low and a valley be raised up a mountain be made low oh lord the valleys go low come on come on roar and i can hear the rhythm of the lion of the tribe of judah i can hear the rhythm of the lion of the tribe of Jesus is coming. I can hear the rhythm of the line of the tribe of Judah. I can hear the rhythm of the line of the tribe of Judah. I can hear the rhythm of the line of the tribe of Judah. I can hear the rhythm of the line of the tribe of Judah. Oh, valley, be raised up on mountain, be made low in oh, a valley, be raised up. where you've at the zoo or something or seen a movie or even a nature where the lion roars it just like stops everything around and it gets the attention I really believe that's what the Lord speaking to our hearts is as a church today we need to rise up and just let that roar of the Lord what's inside of you because the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead lives inside you and I in the book of Isaiah and this is the uh Passion Translation in Isaiah 42, 13, it says, Yahweh goes out to battle like a hero and stirs up his passions and zeal like a mighty warrior. Yes, his godlike shout, his God shout. And another translation says his roar. His God shout is a mighty battle cry. He will triumph heroically over all his foes. Beloved, we need to, to shout the declarations of God over our city and shout the declarations of God over your life and start to rise up and say this far and no more and draw that spiritual line in the sand and say Lord come and move and intervene because you are well able you are well able he's he's done it all he has left nothing undone and we draw the line and say Lord your power might now move in every area of my life 
in every situation, in every circumstance, in every place of healing, God, because I do not have to stay in this place defeated. I can rise up because, Lord, you roar over my life. So, God, right now, in Jesus' name, Father, I just pray, God, that hearts, God, would be lifted, would be lifted, God, by your power and your might. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.
just over it all. Over it all. Let's, let's just raise our hand and let's just declare that bridge. And over the city, Jesus. And over the streets, King Jesus. And over the nations, Jesus. And over the earth, King Jesus. Over our children. And over our children, Jesus. And over our homes, King Jesus. Over our bodies, Jesus, and over our minds, King Jesus, heal our minds, God, and over our children, Jesus, and over our homes, King Jesus, and over our bodies, Jesus. Just stretch forth your hand to the person standing next to you. Just touch their shoulders. We're going to sing this again. Just touch your shoulder. Touch your shoulder. Go ahead, Nicole. Over our bodies, Jesus. Come on, come on. And over our minds, King Jesus. We release Jesus. it. And over our bodies, Jesus. Release healing in Jesus' over name. Our minds, King Jesus. We pray minds to be restored in Jesus' name. And over our bodies, Jesus. And over our minds, King Jesus. And over our bodies, Jesus. And over our minds, King Jesus. And over our bodies, Jesus. And over our minds, King Jesus. And over our bodies, Jesus. And over our minds, King Jesus. Sing over it all, over it all. And over our
And through His own failing love We will not be shaken We will not be shaken We will not be shaken Sing that with us again For we trust in our God And through His unfailing love We will not be shaken We will not be shaken We will not be shaken
we will not be shaken we will not be shaken sing that again we will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken Reading out of Matthew 16 this morning, starting in verse 13, it says, Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do the people say the Son of Man is? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. This church is built on rock, on a solid foundation. Therefore, it will not be shaken. I believe we're in a season where the church feels the pressure of the world. They feel the winds of worldly beliefs. They feel the pressure to conform to the mindset of worldly thinking. And the Lord is saying, don't forget that my church was built on a solid foundation. It will not be shaken. We will overcome. In the face of every circumstance, the Lord has called us to operate out of the power of a transformed mind. And today, church, he's saying, begin to function in that place of the power of a transformed mind. Begin to no longer allow the pressures of the world to impact the way you view the circumstances around you. He's saying, remain steadfast in me and confident in my foundation, my church. It's built on rock. Yes. The Lord gave me uh, actually a ton of words this morning for specific individuals in the body and I think the Lord just wants to encourage some people today the prophetic gifting is meant for the edification of the body so I just want to deliver a few different words today uh, the first one I've got is for you Brandon I uh, have enjoyed getting to know you a little bit but I think I've got a lot more to learn uh, especially after the word the Lord gave me for you okay I can't wait to hear your story but uh he gave me that scene, I can't remember which Rocky it is, but Rocky's in conversation with his son, and his son's frustrated with life, and he doesn't know how to overcome these circumstances, and Rocky tells him, the world ain't all sunshine and rainbows, it's a very mean and nasty place, I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. Life has thrown you some hard times. Life's thrown you some blows that you felt like you couldn't overcome. Later it continues, it says, Sometimes it's not about how hard you can hit, but about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. The Lord said, you've persevered well. 
You've overcome a lot of things that the world and everyone around you thought you wouldn't overcome. And that during those seasons, Rocky is suggesting that we can do it on our own, but the Lord's saying, you're not like Rocky's son. You've walked with him diligently the whole way, even when you didn't realize you were, that there's a voice and the Holy Spirit has been ushering you along and he's saying, just continue to listen to my voice. I'm going to incline your, your ear to my voice. I'm going to be so near to you that you'll recognize new directions you're supposed to take, new ways you're supposed to uh, overcome those circumstances that are so hard. He's saying, Brandon, I'm so proud of you. Let's continue this walk. Don't give up because just as Rocky told his son, you're better than that. That's what the Holy Spirit says to you. Don't give up. You're better than that. Don't quit. Keep striving. And strive in my strength, not your own. Yeah. James, I'm just going to jump on. I was going to give him a prophetic word if you didn't start. Hi, I'm Brandon. It's so nice to meet you. When James was talking about the endurance and faithfulness, the Lord told me, hey, I'm going to come help him. And I was like, you're going to come help him. And I saw, I saw you walking and I saw like this wind that was his glory and his spirit. And like it was manifesting. And when you were tired, kind of like what James was hitting on, like the Lord came and strengthened you. And that really the Lord has seen your faithfulness and endurance. And he gave me Matthew 24, 45 through 47. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? That's what he calls you. Whom his master has set over his household to give them their food and their proper time. Blessed is that servant whose master will find so in doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, I will set you over all my possessions. I really feel like the Lord is gonna bring an increase in your life for things that you have been waiting for and you have been waiting for a long time, some of them. And some of them, you bring them to the Lord and you're like, anytime, God, anytime, that would be great. And I hear the Lord say, now is the time. Now is the time that I don't leave the ones who wait upon me faithfully. I don't leave them without anything in their hands. I really feel like whatever you're contending for, it's going to come to pass. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah. No. If you've got more, you go ahead and help me out. Okay, okay. I appreciate it. So okay. you hear the voice of the Lord so well. Yeah. Okay. This one is interesting because my wife is my best friend. And uh, I sometimes assume I know every little detail of her heart. But really, truly, the Lord's the only one that does. So this word doesn't necessarily make a ton of sense to me. But... It's from the Lord, so I believe it, it will to her. Uh, I was in prayer this morning, and uh, where's Paula? She's way back there. Uh, Paula had a picture of a hand full of jewels, and uh, she said, I don't know what this is about, and the Lord began to work on my own heart, and uh, honey, he, he told me that there's things in your life that you've held on to because they're precious to you and you've been unwilling to give those things to him because you feel like uh, he's going to take them and he wants you to know that the reason he's asking you to give those things to him is because he wants to cherish them with you he values those things as much, if not more, than you do. And they're so personal to him. And he's got that much care for you, that those jewels, he's asking you to give them to him because he cares for you and he cares for those things that are important to you. So. Oh. <laughs> okay. Nick, the Lord gave me a, a word for you. Uh, he showed me a picture of a builder who had demolished a home and he'd taken it all the way to the dirt but initially this builder had this intention of using the old foundation but the old foundation was too damaged and too broken and so he had to start afresh with a brand new foundation. And the Lord says, for the last few years, you've been 
attempting to repair the foundation on your own, but you've come into this new season where the Lord has really put you in a place to rip that foundation out, and he's chosen to partner with you in building that foundation. He says that those areas in your life with your family where you feel like things are too broken, that he has taken and wiped all that out and he's begun to grow you and your family with a brand new foundation. You don't have to worry about uh, patching it here and putting a sister wall over here and uh, building rock on top of that foundation so that you can build your house. He's saying, no, Nick, I have completely wiped that out and I've given you an opportunity to build with me and me alone. And you don't need any other partners. You just need me to build this foundation. And he's so proud of, of your willingness in that place to go ahead and build the foundation that you've not uh, passively stepped back in fear, but that even in those moments where you have been afraid to partner with him in building that foundation, you've so willingly stepped in. So he just rejoices with you. He's proud of you. You're his son with whom he's well pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this one's for Angelica. Actually, as you walked in, uh, I closed my eyes. I was a little distracted. I looked, and then I turned back around. I closed my eyes, and I began to worship, and I saw this plant begin to grow and blossom beautiful flowers and leaves and initially I didn't really understand what the Lord was saying so I began to intercede for you and ask the Lord and what he shared with me was that there's relationships in your life that you have continually watered and you've felt frustrated because they haven't bore fruit yet and the Lord says be patient in your good work because this spring season is coming and it's going to bear good fruit, beautiful fruit, beautiful flowers. So the spring's coming. Yeah. Yeah. Second James, Angela, would you please stand? Just stand right where you're at. I wonder if we just stretch your hands toward her. God is just going to just do some, oh man, yeah, just some supernatural. There's some things uh, there. I, I just see places in your life where you've needed to be shored up, not everywhere. But there's just these little places, and this body is here to help you shore those places up. And as we pray, those areas are going to start to get shored up. So, Father, in Jesus' name, yeah, Lord, you do a work, Father, a partnering God. is never before, God, in her life, God, where she will sense, Lord God, the strength of those around her, God, lifting her up, God. Lord, that she can be all that you've called her to be, God, in Jesus' name. Thank you, God, Lord, for the growth that you're putting inside of her life, God. Thank you, God. And I just see I just see open doors over you, too. Just open doors. Open doors that have been closed in the past, but now they're opening up. And I just see the power anointing of God coming upon your life. Yeah, Lord, just strengthening you, God. Strengthening her, Lord God, in areas... Yeah, Lord, thank you, God. Yeah, he's just doing such amazing things, amazing things. And just lift your hands up to the Lord. Father, fill her, God, afresh and anew. Mm, thank In Jesus' you. name, oh, yeah, Lord, more of your presence, God, more of your presence in her life. In Jesus' name, yeah. amen, 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 amen. All right, so I've got two more here. Uh, the next one's for Brad. Now, I, we haven't kept in touch the way we used to and uh, I want to sit down with lunch or for lunch with you here shortly if you'd be okay with that but the Lord gave me a word for you and uh, he shared with me that there's been this season of your life here recently where you felt frustrated by circumstances and that uh, you felt kind of beat up by the things that have happened in life, but the Lord is wanting to reassure you that this season is actually a, a season of preparation and training for you. That there's this season in the wilderness and in the privacy where the Lord has given you lions and bears, and it's so that you can defeat Goliath in public. 
And that as you defeat Goliath in public, it's going to serve as a testimony that changes generations. So I don't know where you're at in that, but uh, I assure you, the season isn't about how hard you can be beat up by life. It's about all the great things that you get to learn in the midst of it. That the Lord is preparing something really special for you as a result. Yeah, so. Okay, and the last one. Sir, what is your name? Lester. Okay, Lester, are you Tony Anna's dad or Dante's dad? Dante's dad. Okay, okay. Um, amazing people, by the way. <laughs> and this new baby is such a blessing. But um, this morning, watching you worship, uh, the Lord shared with me that on on the contrary to what the enemy has tried to convince you of, that at different seasons of your life, uh, the enemy has whispered in your ear and, and told you that you failed your family, that you've messed up too big, and you, in your own strength at times, have tried to overcome those things and measure up. And the Lord says, Lester, you do measure up. Not only do you measure up, but you've been a complete pillar of strength for your family. That as you raised Dante, the reason Dante's sitting in this chair is because of some of the decisions you made in his childhood. That you were able to shape and mold him into such an amazing man and that it only came through the grace of God. That you've got a personal relationship with the Lord and he just wants more of you. And as you seek him, he will continue to strengthen you and you'll hold your house up. But it only comes through relationship with him so yeah 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 and lester just as before james began to give that word i i just had a i, I just saw you leaning in to jesus's chest just leaning into him and watch you as you just lean into him it's going to be so refreshing for you it's going to take a, a the, the pressure off as you just rest in him and just lean into him yeah bless you brother Ushers, if you'll begin to move forward. Can we do one more word? Are you guys okay with hearing? Can you guys, are you guys ready for one more word? As we bless, yeah. as we bless each other. Something when, <laughs> you know, when you hear someone else get a prophetic word, you can grasp on to be that and say, that's my victory too. That's my breakthrough too. So I love hearing what the Lord is saying to every individual because parts of it just mirror what's happening in my own life. And I go, I'll take that breakthrough. That guy's getting supernatural grace. I will also take that church. So we're going to press in. This gentleman, you're sitting on like the third row in the corner. Yes, you. Alex. Your, your partner figured it out. <laughs> Hi, we've never met. That's okay. But uh, you were just so highlighted to me during worship today. And the Lord says, he's my watcher. Like, I really feel like you are an observer, that you observe all things that happen in its natural habitat. And then I kind of saw you like, looking up at the sky and you looked at the stars and you were just observing like the ecosystem and the cycle of life and you were such a like a biologist you know one who takes in every single part and like you would I see you going to the plants and you would record how how much the plants grew or how much water you gave it in the sunlight to build it to its optimal way and you know what you were so content and I really feel like the Lord speaks to you through his creation and actually, you were kind of like watching God the same way that you watch nature. You're just like, I just take note of these things. I just take note of these things. And I really feel like the Lord told me he's going to like blow your world away. And that he reminded me of the story of Daniel, who was, he was one who watched the stars and, and uh, knew in the seasons and times he was the greatest. But the Lord gave him such visions that just astounded him. He's like, Daniel's like, this is, this is crazy, Lord. I've never seen you like this. You've never acted like this. But I really feel like you're going to have an encounter with the Lord like this. Like, you are going to be doing your normal, your, like, it's not mundane for you because you actually really enjoy the steadiness and that the Lord is just going to come in and be like, no eye has seen, no ear has heard for what I have those, like, what I have planned for you. And it's going to blow you out of, like, your, your current concept of God. It's just going to blow it out. And you know what? You're never going to be the same because you were made for this. You were made for this. Though you love your steadiness, there is something inside that just goes, every once in a while, I'd like to color outside of the lines. 
and that you're like, but I love blinds. But the Lord is like, don't worry, I'm in charge. And I have such plans and purposes for your life. So church, just stretch your hands towards him because I really feel, God, I thank you that you know him. Lord, that you know every hair upon his head as every uh, sand upon the shore. God, Lord, that you have called him to great things. That, Lord, we even contend as a church for his next season. Lord, that it will be one of such encounter with you. That you would mark his heart and his mind and his life, Lord. That he would be totally engulfed just as Moses met you in the burning bush. And it was a changing and turning moment in his life. Lord, that he is coming up for a turn and changing moment and we say yes and amen and we bless you we bless the work of your hands we we bless you in your body and in your mind and we bless you into this next season in your name we pray amen just before one other thing brother i'm really sorry could you could you pray for zach yeah we're, zach why don't you stand up zach's heading out to uh oh kansas city, kansas city this next weekend and you know we've had many from the international house of prayer that have come and joined with us and stuff and so what this is, this is a, a, this trip is different though, because they've given Zach the opportunity that as, as graduates, as IHOP graduates finish up their courses and they look for local churches to come and be a part of that community. And, and so he is going with Chelsea and with Josh and they're just going to be letting people know that there's, there's, there's a church in Pueblo, there's churches in Pueblo, there's houses of there's a house of prayer in Pueblo where people contend for the things of God. And so would you just, and, and Zach's been such a great part of this house, and uh, we just want to bless him and Chelsea and Josh as they travel, and also that God would, would just give him insight and uh, let him just speak a word of clarity and a word of season to students that have graduated that would, uh, their, their heart would be shifted to come and be a part of what's happening. And so. Nicole, why don't you go ahead and pray, yeah. Yeah. Zach, yeah. I know Pi Hop stands for Pueblo Incense House of Prayer, but I saw you guys at your setup desk and you were talking to people and there was literally a fragrance, an Come incense, on. that it was capturing people's hearts and yeah. minds for those that were marked for the work of the Lord in this city and in that house of prayer. So yes. Lord, right now I yes. ask that yes. you would even go before them, God, that yes. you begin to mark hearts. Lord, that those who are called to worship you day and night in the city of Pueblo, yes. Lord, that conversations would just come so easily that even there would be confirming words and statements to the hearts of these students who have never met this team before. Yes. God, there would just be such a divine invitations yes. divine connections god upon that day lord that you have heard the cry from our city thank asking you, you to come that you have found a house thank here you. for your glory to dwell that it would be here in pueblo lord and we stand and we contend lord for those students to come in lord that you would bring them in as the tides get brought yes. in from the sea come. lord it's you wouldn't come. even have to strive zach you could just be come. you because your fragrance the love that you guys have for the city and day and night prayer would just wrap their hearts. Yes. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in this season. Yes. Lord, what you're doing in their lives. We ask for more and contend yes. for more. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank, yes. thank you. you. Amen. Yeah. Such a sweet spirit in this place. Yeah, John, if you'll go ahead and come forward as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the Lord is so personal. He, uh, he is so personal. He knows the deepest parts of our hearts and who we are. So I love that prophetic spirit. And I just want to encourage uh, those of you in here who might kind of long for that, that gift. It's for everyone. It's, it's for everyone. So, uh, Tammy, would you go ahead and bless the offering this morning? Thank you, Lord, for our church, for the ecclesia. Thank you, Lord, that the gates of hell will not prevail against us, and we will reign with you. Thank you, Father, for this time for, to worship and give you our tithes and our offerings, and we just ask you to bless them and bless each person represented here and the ones that couldn't be here today. Watch over Rich and Kathy and keep them safe, Lord, and bring them back safely. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Tammy.
Good morning and welcome to the Life Church, a caring and Christ-centered church. If this is your first time joining us, please fill out a visitor's card located in the seat pocket right in front of you. We want to remind everyone that our Family Fall Festival is right around the corner and it's going to be happening Saturday, October 22nd here at the church. And we also want to let you know that we're in need of donations as well as volunteers. If you'd like to be a volunteer or make a donation of any kind, please see Jason or Hannah Eberhardt. is for everyone who has relationships whether it's at work at home with friends it's literally for everyone who has relationships i love to give people hope we'd like to invite you to join us for our latest life group at tlc titled keep your love on which is meeting every wednesday at 6 30 p.m here at the tlc offices if you have any questions about this life group at tlc please see grace or jane i can also, be sure to join us for our brand new equipping group Thursday at 6.30 p.m. here at the church. For more information, please see your new sheet, and if you have any questions, please see Angela or Kenny Crank. Ladies of TLC, be sure to join us for our brand new women's book study, which is going to be titled, Lies Women Believe and the Truth Which Sets Them Free. This book study is going to be happening every Friday at 10 a.m. here at the church, and we want to let you know that there will be child care provided. Also, ladies, be sure to sign up for our upcoming first annual fall retreat, which is going to be happening October 7th through the 9th. For more information, please see your new sheet. Are you in need of prayer, or would you like to pray on someone's behalf? If so, join us for our intercessory prayer every Thursday at 10 a.m. at the TLC offices. And youth of TLC, be sure to join us for our Rooted Youth Ministry every Thursday night at 6.30 p.m. at our Rooted Youth Ministry room right below the TLC offices. Also, be sure to join us for the Pueblo Incense House of Prayer every Monday at 7 p.m. here at the church. And finally, would you like to become a Partner in Vision with TLC? Partners in Vision is our form of church membership, and we're going to be hosting a Partners in Vision Sunday coming up Sunday, September 25th. If you'd like to sign up and become a Partner in Vision, please sign up on the Church Center app or in the foyer. Kids, you are now free for Sunday school. And now, please join me in welcoming Jason Eberhard as he comes to bring the word. <laughs> All right, good morning. I know I think I say this every time I get up here, but I really am excited every single time I get up here to minister with you guys and just, just do life. I'm not really sure uh, Titus actually leaned over to me and he goes, good luck following that, what was happening here today. And, and it, it really is so perfect in a roundabout way of how my sermon's put together and really just the body of Christ. And so, but as I was preparing this message, again, I feel like every time I come up here, I say, one, I'm excited to be up here and minister with you guys. But two, I also say, how hard of a week it was. Every single time I get up here, I feel like there's like a week that's just chaotic and it's just wild and it's crazy. And so, it, it, matter of fact, last time I got up here, a guy on Saturday, when I was supposed to be preparing my sermon, like really putting it together, he invited me to go shooting, and we were out shooting for like five, six hours. That same guy, um, I was in school all day Saturday, so I was going to put my whole sermon together on Friday. That same guy invited me to go on the boat with him and like nine teenage boys, including Titus, and I couldn't say no, so I said yes, and so I'm out there, and I'm having a good time, and I uh, got pulled on a tube and smacked my face pretty hard. So I'm, I'm wondering if this guy's even from the Lord at this point. He's not in the church here. He's a, a different one, but he's a good b brother in Christ. Um, but so then I start to think, I'm like, why is it every week that I'm going to preach such a like, struggle to get the word together and such, like, just so much chaos going on? So then I stop and I, start and I, I stop and I start to think on the Lord and I said, is this just the normal state of things? It's just, you just, know, you just recognize it more when you, you're trying to prepare something? Like, are you, do you feel that through your week where it's just chaos? Or it's just out of control, things are spinning and you're, you're trying to grasp at something? You're trying to, so then, that's what's going on. You're just out of control, things are, things are nutty. And so when that happens for me, what I try to do is return back to one thing. I've, I've shared this before. And I try to return back to the greatest commandment, 
that Jesus says. He says, love God and love your neighbor. I've shared that before, and that's when things are spinning out of control, that's where I try to revert to, because I'm like, if that's the greatest commandment, if that's what Jesus, they, you know, the Pharisees try to trap Jesus, and they said, well, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And they were like, well, yeah, okay, that's, that's right. So that's where I try to return. I try to, uh, Chris, you used the example last night at our house, the kiss example. Keep it simple, stupid. That's what I try to do. When, I get, when things are like getting out of control, I try to keep it simple, stupid, and try not to get outside of myself. So, so this week, things are spiraling. I'm trying to get this message ready. I have all day um, in school yesterday. The week was just, we we're trying to list two houses, get them under contract. There's just so much happening this week. And so I'm trying to keep it simple and love God and love my neighbor. And I'm finding it hard to do both of them. So I start digging into why this is such a struggle. This is the simplest, first, most, most important command. Why am I struggling to follow that one rule? So I ask God. God, why am I struggling with this so bad? This was God. He says, because you have an identity crisis. So I ask God, God, why do I have an identity crisis? He says, because I didn't create you in your identity. And I stop and I pause on that for a moment. Did God create me with an identity crisis? And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about it and pondering it. So I'm going to do my best to show you what God walked me through. Not just this week. This message has actually been stirring in my heart for a while, but it completely took on a totally different form when I started to put it together. And so I'm going to do my best to show you what God showed me. It might look something like this. Can you put that first picture up? That's me trying to explain my sermon and how it makes perfect sense. God, no, it's, it's chaotic in my mind. And if you know me personally, you know I got lots to say. Words don't have a problem coming out of my mouth, but to apply them into your life, God needs to put them together right. So there's me, there's my sermon notes, and I'm looking at you with big eyes ready to go. So I hope you take what I got going and figure out where our identity crisis is. The title of my sermon is A Longing Heart. You were not created in your own image. You were created in the image of somebody else. Created in the image of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27, then God said, I, let's make them in our image according to our likeness. So he created him in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We all know that. We were created with an identity issue. We were created not in our own image. We were created not in our own understanding. We were created not in our own strength. We were created not in our own being. We were created in the image of God. We know that scripture. If you've been in church for more than three seconds, you've probably heard that. Scripture quoted, you probably know it, it's the beginning of the Bible. But sin took this identity issue that we were, we were created with, and you're like, well, God doesn't create things wrong. God doesn't, God doesn't make a mistake. God, God didn't make a mistake. God created you to find your identity in Him. It was perfect. It was perfect the way it was until it wasn't. Sin took us out of a place of identity issue and put us into a place of an identity crisis. So now we're struggling to find out who we are. We have two points to the longing heart. There's the spiritual and there's the natural. So your heart is longing for two things with your identity. There's two points that we're going to be taking, and the first one's going to be spiritual. Were you born or created, and how will you identify? You were born, everybody knows that, a man and a woman conceived a child. 
Psalms uh, 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. You were born in sin. Sin gave birth to you. A man and a woman conceived a child, and in sin you were born. So now you got this. Now you're really struggling because you say, My identity is in sin. I was born in sin. But later on down in Psalms 139.13, it says, for you created me in my inmost beings. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. So where are we, where are we at? Are we born in this life? Are we created in a spiritual being? Who are we? Where's our identity lie? And I think that's where our struggle is the most in life is because we don't know how to identify because we've lost our true identity and our true image. So you were born in sin. He says it. He says you were born in iniquity in Psalms 51, but then in Psalms 139, he says you knit me together. So were you created or were you born? Who were you identify with? Yes, man sinned. And yes, there was a separation from God. I don't know what God's desire was or his intent in the garden. I don't know how he was going to work all this out before sin entered in. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if he was going to create more people, if Adam and Eve were going to populate the earth. I honestly, I don't know. I don't think anybody does. Because we don't, we don't have even any kind of time lapse and it happened so fast. Sin entered the world so quickly, we don't have this idea of what God would have done in the garden, but I know this, I know this without a doubt. Whatever his plan was before sin entered in, it was good. His plan was perfect. His plan was good for you. How do I know that? Because the essence of God is good. The root of God is good. The core of God is good. When I tell my kids, what's the one thing? They answer back, God is good. What's the one thing? God is good. It's all they need to know for right now. Let them figure the rest out later. How do we know that God's ultimate intention was good and his whole plan for humanity was good when it, sin happened so quick and then you're like, well, I think that could have been God's plan because he created us and he put the tree in there and if he, that's what he wanted to do and then he wanted... The reason we know this without a doubt is because when sin took over and started to run rapid, he bankrupt heaven with Jesus to try to reset what was lost. He sat there and he, he, went through the, he went through the Israelites as a test tube for humanity, showing that men can't be righteous on their own. Then he sent us Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 49 speaks to us about the new Adam. Matter of fact, if you read, if you're taking notes, 1 Corinthians 15, 44 through 49, I didn't put the whole thing up there for sake of not just keep reading and reading and reading, but 15, 44 through 49 speaks of the new Adam. But I just have 49 here. And it says, Just as we have been born the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. This is all, this is the whole thing is about the new Adam. Put up the next one, Romans 5, 18 through 19. Same thing as the last one. If you're taking notes, it's actually Romans 5, 12 through 19 speaks of the new Adam. It doesn't say the same words as the new Adam, but it says, by the one man sin entered, by the one man sin left. So it's the same thing. It's the same concept of Jesus being the new Adam. So we pick it up in verse 18. And it says, consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man many were made righteous. We, were, we bore the image of Adam. 
flesh, bone, but we also bore the image of God. Spirit, life-giving spirit. So who are we going to identify with? How are you going to identify? You're going to identify with your earthly man? I was born of this earth. I have a mother and a father, and that's my identity, even though I look nothing like my dad. Titus, the other day, we were driving down the road, and I said something about Titus being handsome. And he goes, I know. This is my 13-year-old boy. Of course, a teenage boy. He's like, I know. So the only reason you're handsome is because you look just like me. He goes, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. You're my (laughs) mini-me. Titus bears the image of me. He looks like me. His body. I said something about the way we're, we just bought some camel because we're headed out hunting tonight late. And I said, Titus said, well, these don't fit me right. And I said, well, if I was an extra large, I just thought you were a medium. And so we bought these things. And he's like, they don't fit me right. He's like, the only reason they fit you is because you're shaped awkward. I said, you're shaped identical to me. Literally broad shoulders, long torso, somewhat smaller than average legs. Like I know guys that are like 5'10 that wear the same inseam as I do. So like long torso, like it's kind of a weird makeup, but I'm like, you're literally identical to me. So you're over here throwing shade on me, saying I'm shaped awkward and (laughs) teenagers, what the heck? Never even crossed my mind that I'd have one. But you're going to pick an identity. There's no doubt about it. There is no doubt in my mind you will pick one of these identities in life. You will bear the image of your earthly father or your earthly mother in the world system, or you will bear and pick the identity of Christ. Created in the image or born in the image. This is my belief. You can choose to believe it or not. I think the scripture points it out. I think we'll make a case for this. I believe Jesus hit the reset button of what was lost in the garden. Now there's something different. We have to recognize that there is sin in the world now. There was no sin. Now there's sin. But Jesus hit the reset button so you can live the way you were created to live in the image of God. You just have to do it and find a way to do it now with sin all around you. Pressing in all sides, we just sung about that. It didn't say it was a, you know, overtaking us, even though we just sung about that. Though the armies rise up against us on all sides, we will not be shaken. So I believe Jesus hit the reset button, and now through his spirit we have access to the image of God, to bore the image of God. See, I'm not blind to sin being in the world. I don't, I'm not, I don't live in this, um, I couldn't find out. There's, I've talked to people in the past that, that have a belief system. I thought there was an actual religion name to it, so if you know it, you can tell me afterwards. But there's people that, that actually believe we are in the second coming of Christ already. Like, and they don't, they don't even acknowledge Sin. They don't acknowledge that there's an, an enemy out there trying to attack us. They just completely, nope, we're in the second coming. We're glorified, justified. And they don't even, and so the word says, don't be deceived by his scheme. So we have to be aware what's around us and let it rise up, the goodness of God. So I'm aware that there's things around us, but Jesus hit the reset button and did something. So I'm going to walk through some of my beliefs and what I think Jesus did when he was the new Adam. There was separation from God. Through Christ Jesus, we have access. That's fact. That is biblical fact. There was a separation. Through Christ, we have access. We were born into sin. But through Christ Jesus, we were born again into the spirit in the image of God. And if you want, we can go through scripture by scripture by scripture on these things. Um, it's, it's, that's, that stuff's really hard to do when you're trying to preach a 45-minute sermon to give each line. So I'd be happy if anybody has a question or if anybody says, well, I don't I try to agree with that. I'd be happy to sit down with you and talk it through. Because that's what we're supposed to do, right? Condemned through the reset, we're justified. 
There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Couldn't even tell you where that is, but I know it's in there. Toil. We went from toiling in the weeds to cultivating the garden. Now, I speak this over my business on a regular basis. I believe it to the core of who I am that we do not toil in our business. We cultivate and steward faithfully what God's given us. And I'm telling you guys as a testimony, I have seen more miracles in our business than you could even begin to believe. Things that just come up out of the middle of nowhere. Houses that sell for more than what we could expect, faster than what we could expect. When you see something toiling, somebody else toiling, and you're being blessed, you're like, what's the difference here? Like We were just told that the market's turning and spiraling out of control, and it's on a downturn. So I'm a little bit like, okay, Lord, like, here we go. We're listing two houses just on Monday. We listed two houses together at the same exact time on Monday. One house went under contract for full price cash offer. One house went under contract for 5% over asking price. That's not, and, and I'm tell, I've told people that, and they're like, what, are you kidding me? Like my, I, I know this person I just met up in, and, uh, and I'm going to try to help them out. I just met him up at Karis, and they have a house in Pueblo West. 104 days on the market it sat. And they just sent me the list, and I'm looking through the list, and I'm, I don't see anything wrong with it. So I'm going to talk with them and see if we can help them out, because I know that they're believers, and I know that they believe uh, Christ wants blessing for them. But when you see these things, it's hard to deny that we, sin took us out of a place of cultivating the garden and put us in a place of toiling in the weeds. So if I believe Jesus reset what was lost in the garden, then I have to believe it for more than just the, my mind and more than just my heart. I have to believe it for my business, my prosperity, my healing. We'll get there. I'm jumping ahead of myself. <laughs> If Jesus hit reset and our identity is in him and not of the world, we move past the place of poverty to a place of prosperity. Poverty is not just being broke and not having money. Poverty is a lack of enough. Rich people struggle from poverty. They struggle with lack of enough. I've seen it. I've seen millionaires struggle with, have, with not having enough because their identity is in their money and they have a poverty mindset. Poverty has nothing to do with how much you have in the bank. It has everything to do with your identity. So he's taking you out of a place of poverty, lack for enough, and he's putting you into a place of prosperity where you say, I am prosperous in the name of Jesus. I don't need to have that thing Sure, I want that thing, I want that house, I want that car, whatever it is, but God, you've blessed me and I'm gonna steward and I'm gonna cultivate where, the garden that you've put me in. Biblical principles say he was faithful with little can be faithful with much. Matter of fact, expecting, you put that next slide up, expecting heavenly financial prosperity without practicing biblical financial principles is the definition of putting the cart before the horse. It literally is trying to get, tap into this financial resource that God has for every one of us without even putting into practice the things that he's called you to. You're not even cultivating your garden and you're out toiling in the weeds. Stop toiling in the weeds and cultivate your garden and see what God can flourish out of that garden. If Jesus hit the great reset, then he took us out of a place of sickness. There was no sickness in the garden. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no diseases in heaven. And he put us into a place of healing. These are biblical principles that God has for us. Hannah was struggling and dealing with some stuff. Um, and I got her permission to say this. She's not here. She's teaching but she gave me the thumbs up to share it. She was dealing with just a couple, about a month ago, she was dealing with some pain in her chest. And she's asking God, she's like, God, I thought you healed me from these things, and what do I have to do to get complete healing from this thing? This is what God told her. He said, you have familiarized yourself with this, and how can I heal you from something that you are familiar with? 
Phil Cruz, some of you know Phil Cruz, still consider uh, Phil a really good friend of mine, had the chance to preach at his church about eight months ago, nine months ago. Phil Cruz once told me, he said, God won't deliver you from a friend. What are you making friends with? What are, you, what are you familiarizing yourself with? The born image of this world? You making friends, throwing your arm around sickness, throwing your arm around or poverty? You making friends with that? Are you familiarizing yourself? You're getting on a first name basis with sickness, diseases? If you stop identifying and becoming friends with the things of this world and the sicknesses of this world and the diseases of this world, and you start identifying with the, with the, the image of God that you were created in, watch what God can do to your garden. But, 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 I, I know Jesus never promised us a perfectly easy road and, and, and there's a lot of naysayers and, and I'm not blind to that. You know, I have actually misquoted, and it's been misquoted to me a lot, and I have actually misquoted John 16.33. I think I missed it. I don't think I put it in there, did I? I sent this over to them at like 8 o'clock this morning, trying to wrap it all up. John 16.33 says, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. I have actually misquoted that scripture many times in my life as a justification for my trouble, as a justification for things not going right. Taking it into context, if you read all of John 16 all the way down, at the beginning of John 16, he actually says, those who kill you, he's talking to his disciples, he says, those that kill you will think they are doing a service to God. And he goes on down through John 16 saying, how he's going to the Father, how he's given us the Spirit, how we'll have a closer relationship with God than we could ever have. This is what he's telling to his disciples because the Holy Spirit's coming to you. He actually says, it's better for me, it's, on your, um, it, it's to your advantage that I go away, that I can give you my Spirit. And so why would he say all these things about I'm going away, I won't be with you, you're going, to have, you're going to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're going to have a closer relationship with the Father than you've ever had. Uh, anything, you're going to hear what the Spirit says because he speaks on my behalf. And then at the very end of it, he says, but you're going to have troubles, major troubles. You're going to have sicknesses, diseases. You're going to, have, you're going to live in poverty. You won't have enough. All these. Why would Jesus end this scripture like that? He's not saying that. He is talking about troubles, about persecution for his namesake. And I have used that scripture to justify my struggles. I have used that scripture as a justification. In verse 2, oh, that was in verse 2 where he talks about people killing him or killing his disciples. In verse 22, Jesus actually says that you will have joy that nobody can take away. That joy comes through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. I just don't see how Jesus can flip the script from you will have joy that nobody can take away from you to you're going to have major troubles, sicknesses, diseases, all kinds of problems, de depression, addiction. Well, I'm just going to have trouble. See, we're falsely identifying with things of this world when we need to be identifying with things of God. And I'm not blind to it. I'm not blind to the real effects that sin has in the world. I'm just not going to identify myself with them. I'm not going to sit there and say, I, I'm not going to be a fake person either. If I have a cold, I'm not going to sit there and, oh, nope, 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 nope. I'm not going to be fake. I can tell, hey, I'm sick, but I am not an ill person. This sickness is not from God. This thing is, I don't identify with that sickness. I can be like, hey guys, I'm not feeling good. I don't think you should come over to my house tonight because I just got this nasty cough and I don't want to get anybody else sick. I can say that without condemnation, 
But I am not going to sit there and say, man, God must just be testing me. This sickness must be from God, or man, how long this is going to last forever. You start going down that road of fear. You start going down that road. It's not of God. I might be depressed, but I am not, joy comes in the morning. And when you're depressed that next day, you wake up and say, but joy comes in the morning. I'm not going to identify myself as a depressed person. But see, we just accept these things as who we are. This is just who we are. I'm just a depressed person, man. I'm just chronically sick all the time. Don't identify with it. Stop identifying with it. Start identifying with the great reset. So there's also natural things that sin entered the world that maybe I'm, it's going to sound really, really bad. Maybe I'm somewhat thankful for because like before sin entered the world, like I'd probably be standing up here preaching naked. And thank God I'm not doing that. Thank God. Like y'all would be sitting out there just jealous. <laughs> I'm going to say this without looking at any eye contact, but I've seen people that I'm like, thank God for clothes. And then you see people that wear too little and you're like, God, more clothes. More of the realization. So there's, there's this natural element that, that entered the world through sin that we can identify with. We wear clothes. Sin made us ashamed of our bodies. I'm not going to go strip naked and walk through the mall because, oh, God hit the great reset and here I am. You know? And then you find yourself in jail with a, a record for exposing yourself to children and it's a whole problem. Like, wear clothes. Wear clothes. Trust me. Money. We don't know what God's currency was going to be in the garden. We have money. We don't know if, what God was going to do, if it was going to be through trade or if he was just going to keep providing everything and people just didn't have to work and have money. But we understand money. But there's a difference between understanding money and identifying with money. I accept it. It's, it entered the world through sin. Well, we think it entered the world through sin because we don't know what God was going to do before that, but we can assume because he was providing everything for Adam that he would continue to provide everything for us. But we understand money. It's not bad. It's okay to have. I just testified of the goodness of God and the blessing of our business. But it's when I start to identify with money that I become that poverty mindset because I never have enough. So I stop, I stop identifying with that. So there's realistic recognitions of sin entering the world. But then there's this spiritual side that says, I'm just not. We sung a song today and we talked about this holy defiance. Just, I will not identify myself as that. Because that is sin. That is not of God. And I will not identify myself with that. You guys following me here? Am I too much like that, that picture at the beginning? If you take nothing else from point one, Jesus just reset what Adam lost. Just go back and read in the garden and how Adam lived and God providing his needs. There was no shame, even though we talk about it as is a funny joke about clothes and nakedness. There was no shame. There was no condemnation. There was no guilt. That's how we want to live. Going on to number two, the natural. My body, your choice. This is the natural. You guys know the my body, my choice type of thing? A little spin on that. My body, your choice. And I'll show you why I got to there. I just like to have funny little headlines, something catchy so you might remember it. Pastor Rich likes to talk about our relationship with God is like this, and so it's easy to walk like that, and you, you're just kind of in this flow. But then when you come out of that for a moment, and you realize you still have to live on this earth, you have to live like this with people. You have to live like that with people. And I was just in, up at uh, Karish yesterday in school, and 
he said, the, you didn't, when you got saved, you didn't get a personal rapture up into heaven because God left you here for the Great Commission, an assignment. So your body, I'm sorry, my body, your choice. 1 Corinthians 12, 26. If one part, he's talking about the whole body here, if you read all of uh, chapter 12. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Your identity with God does affect me. Your lack of identity with God does affect me. Because we are the body of Christ. And I can only be as strong and do the call of God with the body that I am connected with. Otherwise, I'm just out there by myself. I'm out there isolated, trying to do my own thing. And now I'm walking in a fence because nobody else wants to help. Nobody else wants to do anything. And I've completely cut off from the body. My body, my body of Christ, your choice. What are you going to do with my body in Christ? Are you going to identify with God and connect to the body and further the kingdom, further your assignment? So your heart longs for this. Your heart longs for this. And it's because your heart longs for that identity with people and in relationship because God is that God. God is that God and you were created in that image. So that's why you long for it. And why do I... Why do I get hurt when people don't come on? Why do people you know, call and then you just get cold and you just shut the world off and you don't even understand that your heart is crying out for relationship because that's who you're created after. Matthew 18, 19, and 20. I just re realized that. 18, 19, 20. Sorry. get stuck in my own little mind and you guys get a glimpse of the wild that's up there every now and then. <laughs> Trust me, guys, if you know me personally, there's a lot rattle around up there and sometimes to put it together like this is uh, quite the struggle. Uh, starting in chapter 19, this is Christ's words, Jesus' words. He says again, truly I tell you, if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. This is Solomon, probably. Ecclesiastes author. We kind of, we're pretty certain it's Solomon, but there's no actual proof, but if you kind of take down uh, through the ages of how he lived his life, this would exactly line up with how he lived his life. So Solomon, wisest man to ever live. I'm telling you, let's just, uh, this, isn't, this is totally not in my notes here. This, is, this was just came out of a conversation I asked with a guy the other day. We were kind of going round and round, and he was just talking about Solomon and how he loved Solomon and how great Solomon was, and he continued to pray Solomon. And I said, well, like Solomon had his struggles too. Like, I love Solomon, but have you read Ecclesiastes sometimes? Like, the start of Ecclesiastes is just dread. Everything's dread. What's it for? I've tried everything, and everything, it's horrible. So Solomon had his moments of dread. And he, the guy actually got offended with me. He's like, why would you do that? I have this idea of Solomon, you're trying to ruin it. I said, no, I'm trying to be realistic with you. Like, people have problems, <laughs> even Solomon. So I actually said, like, realistically, if, so, if God comes to you like he did Solomon and says, anything, anything you want, it's yours, I'm probably selling myself way short because I'd probably ask for just, like, 20 acres on a nice farmland out in the Mesa. <laughs> and Solomon's like, wisdom. More wisdom. And I'm like, Wisdom? Don't, you know, because <laughs> Solomon knew he was raised in the house of David. He knew what's up. Eh, side note, I would sell myself way short. So here's Solomon, wisest man to ever live, according to the scripture. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. It says, two 
are better than one because they get a good return for their labor. If one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But if they, if one, but how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. It's God's principles and God's design for you to walk in the body of Christ. Yeah, yeah, it is God's design for you to tap into the body of Christ. But with that tapping in, I need you to identify with God. You need me to identify with God. Because otherwise, it's just going to turn into a social club. Otherwise, the body of Christ is just going to turn into this feel-good, get-together, not-make-any-kind-of-kingdom-impact type of club. See, God is a God of unity. God is a God of connection. God is a God. He has the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. God... I know you all going to know this, well, most people should, that this is impossible, what I'm going to say, but God by himself doesn't need Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He's God. He's like, he's the creator of the world. Like, I don't need them. Like, if we realize how amazing God is and how powerful he is, well, then he can do whatever he wants. But he is three in one. He is the example of unity. Why would he be that? Forever and ever and ever. For, from the cre- it says the word was with God before the creation of the world. The word is Jesus, because, you know, I hope you follow that. The word being Jesus was with God since before the creation of the world. God's a God of unity. God's a God of body. Throughout the entire New Testament, he, it's constant. Paul is like the body, the body, unity, unity. Church, get this. Church, get this. But your heart longs for that relationship. And the church is caught sleeping on this issue. Gangs get this. We have gangs throughout all over Pueblo here and and even worse in other parts. Dante, you grew up in Sacramento. You know there's gangs there. Lots of them. Gangs understand the longing of a heart of a young boy or girl to be a part of something. They don't even treat these young men and women right. But these young men and women sell it all out for it. Because they long to be a part of something. Sports understand this. And I'm not bashing on sports here. Like, my three kids play sports. I played sports growing up. I play fantasy football. I have a favorite football team. I'm not. But sports get the idea of identity better than the church is. Because if I can get you to identify as a Bronco fan, not just like, oh yeah, I like the Broncos, but that's my team. Nobody else. You're going to hate Raider fans. They know this. If you can identify as a Raiders fan, like Dante. Sorry, I just put a target on your back. (laughs) Hey, he was born out there. It's okay. I was born in Minnesota. I can be a Vikings fan. There's justification for it. There's no condemnation for being a Raiders fan in Christ Jesus. Sports get this, and they, 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 they capitalize on it because they want you to connect with them. You say, we lost, and, and oh, I had a bad day because my... I, I grew up hating the Broncos. Sorry, y'all. If the Broncos won, the Packers won, and the Vikings lost on a Sunday... I was devastated until next Sunday when it was game time. That was my routine September through January every year because I identified as that person. And then you buy into the lie, oh, these guys, it's all for the fans, we're doing it for, no, you're not. No, you're doing it for the glory and the money. Strip all that away, don't televise them. Don't pay them, you know, $50 million a year. I guarantee they're not doing it for you. I promise you. But I'm, I don't mean to condemn anybody. I, I was just telling Titus the other day, I was like, I don't wear um, jerseys anymore. I just stopped wearing jerseys. I used to wear an Adrian Peterson jersey. He, I idolized the guy. 
totally idolized the guy. And then it turns out he's beating his kids, doing drugs all the time. Then I watch him on his 30th birthday. He rides in on this elephant in like this gold robe, and I just saw vanity. Like, and, and I was like, maybe it was just my maturity level at the time. I was just like, I'm idolizing this person. And Titus is all, well, I, I wear jerseys. And I was like, hey, I'm not trying to like, like, this is me. I'm just telling you what I decided to do. And he thought, it's like, should I not wear that? And I'm like, dude, stop. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying you shouldn't wear Blackman's jersey. Titus loves Blackman from the Rockies. I'm like, I'm not, that's not where I'm going. This is me. I just had this revelation that I, was, I, that I was idolizing this man who was living in vanity. And not even a good person, not even a good dad. And I was just like, uh-uh, not for me anymore. I still love my Viking shirts, my Rocky shirts. Just, uh, it's for the team. Politics get this. Ooh, that's a touchy subject. Politics get this. There's a two-party system. And you wear your political party on your shirt like a badge of honor. And you walk around like, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. And you wear it like it's something that means something to you. And they, it's caused division it's caused hurt, and there's, and thank you, uh, I was, Kenny's not here today, but thank you guys so much for taking this mantle of, you guys are in this class right now called uh, Biblical Citizenship. Thank you so much for doing that, because we need to stop identifying ourselves as a Republican, as a Democrat, and we need to start to identify ourselves with Biblical Citizenship. I'm not saying bury your head in the sand and don't go vote. I want 100% turnout from this church in voting. 100% turnout. And I'm not telling you to vote for one party or the next. I'm telling you to vote for biblical principles because if you identify at the beginning as a child of God, then you're going to be like a five-topic voter. If, you do, if, you, if this candidate supports life, if this candidate supports... I could go through them all and... Keeping us in church, freedom of religion, vote. Don't care what party. If you defend life, if you defend liberty, if you defend my freedom of religion to worship my God, and you identify that this is a Christian nation, you got my vote. But politics, I, they, they get this. They get it better than the church does. They know you want to align with something so bad they're going to make you hate the other side. And they're going to pull you in. They're going to, they're going to make you identify, oh, I'm a Republican. Oh, I'm, a, I'm a Democrat. And now there's this confusion in this. I'm a biblical citizen. And I'm going to vote for biblical citizen rights. And I'm going to identify uh, America as a Christian nation. I want 100 I would love if this church had 100% turnout to vote. One, do you know the church has historically a 25% turnout, 25% turnout to vote. And then we ask ourselves why abortion can, why some of these places are passing abortion laws after the kid's been born and alive for like, well, how many days is it up in Maine? Four days? Four days in Colorado and we ask ourselves why this tragedy is happening. The church is asleep and we haven't identified ourselves as believers that are empowered by God and we haven't started to connect to the body to advance the kingdom. See, it's my body, your choice. You are limiting me by not identifying as a child of God. I ident I'm limiting you by not identifying as a child of God. I need you to be blessed so I can stop weeping. Because if you weep, I have to weep with you. The body has to mourn when you mourn. The body has to rejoice when you rejoice. I want more rejoicing. Would you stop weeping and start being blessed so I can start rejoicing with you? I need you to identify as a child of God. I need you to join me in the fight for the kingdom. God's got things coming, guys for the body of Christ. I was up at a Truth and Liberty conference last weekend and 
And they were saying that there's things that are happening in the body that they couldn't even, they didn't even want to talk about yet. They were like, we're, we're holding these in for just a moment because to get it out would expose some of the things that God's doing behind the scenes. So we're going to hold on to it for a minute. And I can say that personally for myself. I was talking to a guy here at church, uh, Ian. I was talking to you last men's group and I was saying, I don't mean to speak vague to you. I was kind of sharing my story and what God's doing and calling me into. And I said, I know I'm speaking vague. I know I'm speaking kind of abstract. That's because God hasn't given me the full release to say. I'm still in a waiting season right now for what God's doing. But God is stirring something, you guys. And it is so big. And we are going to either join as the body, start identifying individually as children of God and His goodness and His glory, and we're going to join together and advance the kingdom, or it's just going to pass you by. Or you're going to be sitting there like, what the heck? I could have been a part of that. Or, or we're going to miss it. This body. This body will miss it, and God will move on and do it somewhere else. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about your neighbor. Just, like, you identify as a child of God perfectly fine. You don't, you don't have any issues at all. I'm talking about the one next to you. Don't worry. This is for them. Look at your neighbor and say, that's for you. <laughs> You, I won't even make eye contact. You are perfectly fine. <laughs> Created in the image of God. Beautifully and wonderfully made. Jesus has a heart that we are one. That's his biggest heart. I'm going to close. We read out of John, uh, well, actually we didn't because I didn't put it up. John 16. The whole scripture where it talks about uh, you will have trouble, take heart, I've overcome the world. And if you read through the rest of John 16, it's all about the Father coming. This is what Jesus follows it up with. He follows it up in, in John 17. At first, it says, after saying these things, I'm going to the very beginning of 17. This is not there, but I'm giving you a little bit of the backstory here. At the very beginning of 17, after saying all these things, talking to his disciples, I'm going to the Father, the Spirit's coming to you, he's going to empower you, you're going to have joy nobody can take, you might get killed, but you might have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world, and then he goes on to turn his attention to God. And he looks up to heaven, and he starts praying, a prayer, an intimate prayer between him and God, him and the Father. Then he comes down, and he looks at his disciples, and he starts praying a, a blessing over them, a word of protection over them. And then he looks past his disciples and he sees us. Looks all the way out from his disciples all the way through and he sees you sitting right here. And this is what he prays. John 17, 20 and 23. He says, my prayer is not for them alone, disciples. My prayer is also for those who will believe in me through their message, us. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may, there also, may, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity." Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me or loved them even as you have loved me. If that doesn't sum up the whole sermon, there's not another passage that will. He, God is a God of unity. God is a God of oneness. And God is a God that passes his glory on to you, the glory that God gave Jesus. And he does it for a purpose that we might be complete unity in oneness and why? So that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. We have to stop sleeping. We have to stop falling asleep at the will while the world understands identity better than the church does. We were created in the image of God. Can you put up that other picture? I love this picture. I look at it frequently.
Church is not a cruise ship where a handful of people serve everyone else who are relaxing. No, the church is a battleship where it's all hands on deck and everyone serves the mission. The reason you didn't get your personal rapture when you got saved is because you have a mission. And I need you to be all hands on deck. You need me to be all hands on deck. To be obedient to the calling of God. Personal story. This is in closing. Um, You can play some music if that's what you guys are going to do today. I am responding to a call of God in my life. And it comes with sacrifice. So don't think that it's not going to come with sacrifice. Yesterday, if I get emotional, it's because it's a, it's a real thing. I'm up in school all day from 10 to 5. And I miss two soccer games for my sons. And it just, it just rips me apart because I love my children. I love my children. And I sit there and I'm kind of weeping as I sit there, and I'm like, what am I doing here? Like, Hannah's sending me pictures of them, and she says, Caden just scored. And I'm like, what am I doing all the way, an hour and 15 minutes away, when my kids are down there playing sports? God says you're teaching them obedience. I'm being obedient what God told me to do, regardless of the cost. Because you guys deserve that of me. And I deserve that of you. This body has an opportunity to do something for this town. Will you be obedient? If you're living outside of the calling of God, will you respond to the call of God? Will you start to take the identity that Christ has for you and the goodness that he has for you and will you start to apply it? The way that uh, John 17, 20 through 23 says, that we be brought together in complete unity. I know you're already being obedient. Don't <laughs> trust me. It's not you, it's your neighbor I'm talking to. Remember that. You can sit back and relax. But that call, that obedience costs something. The family of God and the purposes of God are going to have to rise higher than my children's sport from time to time. I'm with my children at every practice, Monday through Friday. I'm taking Titus out hunting, just me and him, for four days. It's important. My children are important. My family's important. But so is the body of God. So is the kingdom purposes that God has for us. So I hope you guys, I hope that wasn't too scattered. I hope that wasn't like the picture I put up at the beginning. I want to speak a blessing over you guys. I want to speak a blessing of identity over my body, over my people, over my family. Would you receive that? Put your hands out. Put your hands out. I don't speak this on my behalf. I didn't even prepare anything for this. I just want to speak the identity of Christ over you. That you no longer identify with the things that were lost in the garden when sin entered the world, but you would identify with the reset that Christ Jesus has. You are a child of God, the Most High, and you have His Spirit living inside of you. And I pray that you would identify with that Spirit, life-giving Spirit. The identity of Christ over you right now. Not just because you're special, which you are, because you're a child of God and he wants to use you for the purposes in the kingdom of heaven. I speak a release of time over you. 
I, re- I, I release uh, the toil in the weeds and I say that you're cultivating your garden in Jesus' name. May you be blessed today as you go. May you take the power of the Spirit in you and sow seed in your garden, in your sphere of influence, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have, you know, the guys, this isn't some, I'm not up here in a, in a role of perfection and a theologian by no means, um, although maybe one day I'm working towards that. But I am not opposed to answering questions. I'm not opposed to being like, I don't, I don't quite see what you mean here, and, and walk it through, because we're the body. Encouraging each other, lifting each other up. I'm not opposed to answering questions if you didn't catch part of it. This isn't like a one say and then it's all done. If you have any questions, please ask me. If you need any prayer about your identity, and you don't know who you are, please come up. We'll pray with you. We will release that identity inside of you. In Jesus' name. Have a blessed day, guys. We love you.